Thank you for coming, everyone, this morning, um, and good morning. We'll start immediately with um, arrays, because that is the next basic concept that we need to know about when you think about programming. Arrays are almost everywhere in each programming language. But first, I want to recap what we've seen last time. I hope you had lots of practice in this, because uh, it was part of last week's and the week before's exercises. So we know now that functions are a way to kind of partition pieces of your program in meaningful blocks. Um, so that means that if you have a piece of code, which are a, a sequence of statements that are one after the other being executed, mm -hmm. you can wrap this up in a function. The other thing that you need to remember about a function is that it can have parameters. You basically give it values. And as we've seen, we usually call this function by value. That means even if you put a variable in as one of the parameters, then what is happening in the background is that its value is being copied and given to the function. Not the actual variable is given to the function, but its value only. And functions always return something. That you also need to know. That's how you need to start in declaring your function. And in this case, it's an integer, for instance, but it can be any of the types we've seen, including also this void, which means the function doesn't do anything or it doesn't give anything back. It does do something, but it doesn't give anything back. Basically, void being no return value. Okay. And that means uh, this returning needs an extra keyword, the one that we already know from main, from main function, namely this return. And it can happen anywhere in your function. And at that point, the function is uh, uh, broken down. So basically, the function ceases to exist. All the variables, all the um, parameters that, uh, that used to be there for the function are erased from memory. And what is returned is the value of uh, a over here. And that is basically what is happening in the background of a function. Knowing how that works is quite important because that is what we're going to see from now on um, on a weekly basis. So as promised today, we're going to see the first part of arrays. And arrays are fairly simple uh, as a concept because they kind of are an extension of what we already know from variables. So what we know already is that we have basic types. And in this course, we look at the most basic types only, which are integers, floats, doubles, bools, and characters. Those you know by now already. And whenever you have one of those variables of those types, then the type already tells the compiler how many bytes it, is, it needs to reserve in memory for that variable, um, how to interpret those bits and bytes in memory, and also knows what operations are legal. That means those three things are necessary uh, or are immediately coming along with the fact that we have types in C++. So here is a quick example. Say in your code you have somewhere the variable height and the variable width, and you tell the compiler that these are of type integer, then the compiler immediately knows that it needs to reserve four bytes in memory for each of those two. Then it knows that it needs to organize those four bytes, or 32 bits, in such a way that it can map a number from minus 2 billion to more or less 2 billion. And that uh, the star, which is the operator for multiplication, is valid here. If those two were booleans, for instance, that would have been a completely different story. Right? So, and this way, we've seen that, for instance, the division does different things on integers than it does on floats or doubles. Also, that is something that we already know. So this operation knows, OK, I have here two integers. So this operation is valid, and it does this particular thing, namely multiplication. Right, Arrays are an extension of exactly these type of, uh, of variables that we've already seen. So for any of those variables, you can have an array, which is in itself a type on its own. So basically, an array is kind of a collection, a sequence of one of those, of, of multiple of those variables. So they're all of the same type. That is the, the important part here. You can't have an array where one element is a bool and another element is a double. Basically, all of them need to be either bool or all of them need to be double. Um, and you have an array that is always defined in memory as having a particular size. Again, just like the variables, it's important for our C++ compiler to know how much space to reserve. So therefore, whenever you start saying to the compiler, I need now not just one integer, but I need 20 integers organized as an array, then you need to already say this number 20. 
because then the compiler knows how much space in memory to reserve for this array. And another tricky thing that is the, the ground uh, for lots of lots of problems is that uh, these elements of these arrays are indexed. And they're not indexed from 1 to n, where n is the size of the array, like from 1 to 20, but it's, they're indexed from 0 to 19 in that case. It's just because in, by, with numbering, with most numbers, especially if you make the most out of um, a binary number, then you start at 0. You start counting at 0, then 1, then 2, then 3, and so on. Um, and that is sometimes a bit of uh, a, a, a bit confusing, but I think also there, if you get the hang of it, you will automatically cope with this. Um, and to kind of give a first example of many that we will see, here we have an array of floats this time. We haven't used floats in a long time, so we use an array of floats. And we immediately specify with, with these square braces that there are seven floats. So seven is the size of the array. So we have seven float variables. They are all addressed via this name, my array, which I could have called anything, right? But I just call this my array. And the indices are then, as we know from here, from this line, 0, 2, 6. And in memory, in that case, this looks like this. So we basically have seven elements over here. And we can number them from 1 to 7, just uh, in, our, in our brain, so to say. But uh, from the compiler's point of view, you need to index them from 0 to 6. So my array 0 is the first element. My array 1 is the second element and so on until my array 6, that is the last element, the seventh element. Okay, and all of those are four bytes because we know that a float uh, type is always uh, uh, modeled into four bytes. So that is the basic idea about starting an array, right? And once you have these arrays, um, or once you have an array like this one, you can uh, access any of those elements like this and treat them as a normal variable, as we already had. Right? So there's not that much change, except that you now have a bunch of those floats, not just one. And you access all of those floats through the same name. And that is then called an array. Now, initializing an array, there's multiple ways of doing this. Um, and there's, of course, uh, fast ways, because typically you could also initialize those with a for loop. Um, if, they're, if they're bigger, you'll have to. But if they're small enough, you can initialize them straight with, in such a way. In this case, we have a new concept again, the curly braces, not for starting a block, but for basically starting a constant array. So everything that is over here on the right side of this equal operator is a constant array, an array of constants. And we know this constant over here is a, bool a double, Right? So this is a double, this is a double, this is a double, and this is a double. And this notation here is basically an array of constant size 4, or the constant array of 4 that won't change anymore, and it has four constant doubles in it. And this allows the compiler to immediately parse this as an array of size 4 of type double with these particular constants in it. And this is then put somewhere in memory, and assigned to this array over here. In this case, we can put the 4 here, because this is a, an array of size 4, but we don't have to, because the compiler already knows that this array over here is of size 4, so it can automatically say, okay, then we assume that my array is also meant to be 4. If you would say 5 here or something else, you would get an error, because the compiler would be then confused about this, obviously. Right, so this is basically the way to assign smaller arrays immediately in two particular values. Right, so that you can put a 4 here or you can leave it out. It's kind of a shortcut because the compiler already knows uh, what size this constant array over here is. Right, so it's just like the initialization of variables, except that you now have a collection of those variables. Another thing that we need to see for arrays is that we can actually find out how big an array is. And this is coming from C, the C language, so it's a little bit low level again. There is a built-in keyword called size of. It's an operator, technically, so it's not a function. Um, and and it's, it looks like a function, but it isn't. And this size of operator kind of 
tells you how many bytes this particular array is. So as it's one single parameter, size of needs an array, and then it will automatically say for this array I have stored so many bytes. So size of only gives you the bytes. Um, that doesn't mean if you give this array over here, size of my array, it would give you not four, because this does not hold four bytes, it would give you 16, because this is four bytes, this is four bytes, this is four bytes, and this is four bytes. Four times four is 16. So in this case, you can catch this or assign this to a variable. So in this case, my array size is an integer. And I get here the size of my array, which I just told you is 16, right? This whole array is 16 bytes long. And if I want to know now how many elements there are in this array, I just need to get the size of the first array element. Also, this size of my array zero is in that case returning how many bytes um, this particular element has, which is four bytes. So this would be an elegant way of seeing how many elements are in my array. So in this case, it would give you four, and my array size would be in that case four. This would be later, or will become later, uh, much more important when we are dealing with arrays that, like here, for instance, are assigned and where we don't really have a size, or we don't are, we're not really interested in a size. It could have any size, perhaps. But then in, uh, we want to avoid, of course, that we want to go over this array size. Now, if you have a really large array, like thousands of elements long, you can't initialize an array like this. Or you can, but then your source code will look very messy because in your source code, you will have an array where you need to initialize this as a thousands uh, element array, which typically is extremely big in your text file. So obviously, then what typically people do is you initialize the array and the best thing to do in that case is to do this with a for loop. A for loop as is a typical thing because we know here how big our array is going to be. In our assignments, we know or we should know how many times we are assigning a value, right? So therefore, we need to know how big our array is. In this case, my array is an array of Booleans, 400 of them, too big to immediately in initialize them as we've seen before. And in this case, we do this with a for loop. So with a for loop, we go from 0 to 399. Those are the indices of our array elements. And then my array 0 to all the way till my array 399 will be set to false with this one single comment, which is, of course, a lot easier than having uh, 400 falses here or 400 zeros here uh, in a row. So that is how you initialize an array. Here's an example of what you could do with an array. So sometimes you have concepts in your program where things need to be stuck together. Like, for instance, a vector. If you, want to, um, if you want to represent a location in 3D, in Cartesian coordinates, you need three components, X, Y, and Z components in 3D space, if you have a certain base. And you could do this with a 3D vector, for instance. Here you have Y, which is an array of three doubles. And those are indexed from 0 to 2 in that case. You know, this is the first element, the second element, and the third element. And you can give them values like this, or, as we've seen, you can also initialize them quicker, like, for instance, here, x is exactly the same type of, of uh, 3D vector. We basically say x is an array. That's why you have these square braces. And when we initialize them straight away with this constant array on the right side of the assignment operator, we know that uh, the size of this um, array is 3 already, so x will be created as an array of size 3 with these particular elements initialized in the three elements of x. And that is conceptually what we kind of think of here. So basically for the three axes, in this case I have x1, x2, and x3 like this, we can basically then say that our x vector is exactly at this position, for instance. Um, and if we then change this vector, so that we take one component and instead of 1.5, we change this to 3.0, then this vector's uh, appearance in 3D will definitely also change. Right? So this is how this, this array is a collection of variables that belong together. Right? So that, that's kind of one example, of which we will see many more today. All right. Now the, the, the reason why we always need to know how big an array is, and that's why I stressed uh, this uh, with our size of, 
uh, operator is that you can in C++ write be, uh, beyond an array boundary. Many programming languages, in fact, most programming languages nowadays don't allow this. The compiler automatically checks for this and then gives an error or, or stops working. It says basically you try to go over this array boundary and that is dangerous. And it is dangerous indeed because then you can access pieces of memory that you don't really have control of. I mean, this really depends on the C++ compiler, but typically this can be very dangerous and it's a, a form of a buffer overrun. That means you have a piece of memory reserved for you for this array, and if you go over the boundaries of this array, you're reading pieces of memory that don't really belong to this array. They might not even belong to your program. They might be belong to somebody else's process, where, for instance, they're sending their passwords. Uh, so that, that basically is the, the reason why it's really important to make sure that your arrays never over are uh, overrun. So here we have an example of another my array array of integers, four integers, with these particular uh, integers already initialized as the array. And if you then have another integer, say uh, five, then it could happen that you can actually also get this, this uh, element of my array. What the C, comp the C++ compiler will tell you is it will warn you. It will say, well, in this case, my array is of size 4, and you're going beyond this size. In some circumstances, the compiler doesn't always know how big an array is, and in that case, it could happen that it does not even warn you. And what happens in that case is that it basically reads the first element. If you tell it to read the first element, so my array is 0, will read then this 9 over here. My array 1 will read this 8 over here. My array 3 will read this 6 over here. But just as easily, you could then also say my array 4, which is not reserved to the array that we just saw. In that case, what could happen is that you're reading a completely different piece of memory that is not assigned to my array. For instance, it could be assigned to my integer, and it could then also return 5. There's no guarantee here. Typically, um, it might be something completely different, but try this out and you'll see that this line over here is possible. It will often, in G++, it will generate a warning because in this case it's easy to see that this array is only four elements long. And if you then access the fifth element over here with my array four, then you will get an, a warning, but not an error. That means it will compile and you will in the end have an executable, a program generated that you can run. Right? And, this, and when this program runs, you're basically accessing a piece of memory that was never really assigned to you. And that's dangerous. That's kind of the, the root cause of so many security problems. Right? So that's why it's important to always keep check on how big your array is. All right, here are a couple of examples. Um, now I'm going to just quickly show the first two examples. I'm not going to solve them because they should be fairly simple. They're almost kind of exactly the same what we've seen with loops. So here you have to initialize um, an array of 50. That means you have to initialize already a very big array. You could do this the hard way, where you can basically say we assign it to and then curly braces open and then you start um, getting 50 booleans separated by commas and then you close your curly braces. As we've seen, that is possible but then you will uh, end up with a big CPP file that is not that easy to read. Typically, if there is some systematic way to initialize this array, it is nicer to do this straight away with a loop, with some type of heuristic. And that's exactly what I'm asking here in this, um, in this example. So here the array needs to start with a true, true, and then a false. And then again, true, true, and then a false again, a true, true, false again, and so on, all the way to 50. So basically, this is just kind of a, a loop e exercise, except that here in this case, you need to initialize an array with this particular loop. Right? So that, this should be something that you already know. I kind of gave already the, the, the skeleton structure of the program, um, and then you can continue the rest uh, at home. This is a little bit uh, more difficult. So in this case, um, this is using user input. You basically, in this case, have to, again, with a loop, ask the user 10 integers. So the user could then give any particular number. And we assume here the user does that. 
The user does not start writing text, for instance. We hope that the user, in this case, gives valid integers. So you don't need to do any, any other checking, although that would be also quite a nice exercise. But that, this is kind of um, enough, I think, already as an exercise. So just use that loop. And then basically, at the end, you have an array of 10 in integers. This is in my array. And then the, end, the next thing would be of this question is calculate the average of those 10 integers. Now this is very similar to um, one of the exercises that you could have had last week. So that, that would be another one that is slightly more difficult, so try those at home. Today we're going to do a little bit more difficult uh, of an exercise where we're going to draw a histogram in the terminal. So it's very similar to the previous question, except here the user does not get the input of our integers. In this case, we get them straight away from a function that we can uh, insert. So this exercise, I'll already show you another type of library, which is called random. And this random library is giving you the access to this function, rand. And this rand is giving you a pseudo-random integer. We're seeing this this way in a very simplistic form, without seeding and everything else. If you want to know more about why this is a pseudo-random integer and why we, when you repeat this, um, this program, you see always the same integers, then click on this link and you will see how to fix that, basically. Um, but this is, this is kind of the start of the program. So we start with our main function. We don't need functions here. Uh, other functions here, we just uh, do everything in our main function. We have an array of 17 integers from 0 to 16. Therefore, we have a for loop here that goes from 0 to, to 16. We stop when i becomes 17. And then for any of those elements, we then say this element is random. This is a function that returns, in this case, a random integer. As we know, integers can be extremely big. In this case, it's random. Uh, will give you a positive integer, but that can be also 2 billion, as we've seen. So in this case, we constrain it to something that is between 0 and 24 with our trusty modulo operator, which you already used a few times. In this case, our modulo operator kind of limits the random number from 0 to 24. If it were to be 25, then the outcome of this would be a 0 again. If it were 26, it would be a 1. If it were to be 27, it would be a 2, and so on. Right? So that, that means, or if it's um, 48, it would be 24. If it's 49, it would be a 0 again, and so on. Right? So whatever number random is, we basically map it to, zero, uh, to a range from 0 to 24 with this particular construct using our modulo operator. So in this case, all the elements of my array will have an, a number from 0 to 24 kind of randomly assigned to them. And now the question is, how can we make a nice histogram bar chart out of this? Something that should look like this over here. Right? That's, that's something that we can do because whenever we output something to the terminal, we can create in a string a Unicode character. And this Unicode character basically uh, gives you this block over here. There's many more. You can experiment with that. There are smileys, there are um, cards, uh, symbols, there are Chinese symbols, whatever. You can basically put all of those in the terminal and you will see them as well represented, typically. All right, so let's do that now. And well, let's go up and increase the size a little bit. Let's see where I am. Okay, um, I think I already have this in tests. Let's see. There we go. That's exactly what is on the slides. Um, and over here, I'm going to compile in a second. So, so here we need to go to tests. Right, so this is our program. And we want to, in the end, see what is going on. Now, we can already save this and compile this. So this works, and if we run it, we basically see that we get pseudo-random numbers from 0 to 24. So there is no, oh, there's a 24 here, there's no 0, but, you know, basically it could have happened. And if you do it on your uh, end, you might uh, get completely different numbers. No, you will get completely different numbers. It would be very unusual if you would have uh, different ones. 
Now, we're going to um, do this, but we're going to also then create a bar after each number. So if you have an 8 here, we need to create a bar of 8. If we have an 11 here, we need to create a bar of 11. I think that is fairly simple to do, but it's just a very good uh, loop example, I would say. So in this case, we could say um, we first uh, write out the number. Now, it could be that some numbers are two digits, some numbers are one digit. We want to start here straight after the number with blocks. Remember that, you know, here, for instance, 3 has a space, whereas 19 doesn't. I think that is a very simple uh, exercise. How do we deal with that? If, exactly. What do we check in this case? Number. Exactly the number. And our, our, our current number here, we're still in the for loop, is of, of our array? Two. Smaller than two. Is smaller than two. Yeah, because you have a two number. Some, sometimes you have a one number, sometimes you have a two number. True, but how do we check that? Exactly, smaller than 10. Right, so basically, I mean, sure, you write the digits should be, uh, is one or two, but how do we know that, that it has one digit or that it has two digits? Well, if it's smaller than 10, it has one digit. If it's bigger or else, you know, we have two digits because we know that we limit it to 24, right? So that's, that is kind of uh, easy to see. Right, so the basically, and what is our current element? Yeah, my array, and then the index should be? I, exactly. So if my current element is smaller than 10, what do I do then? I output, first of all, I should remove this end line over here, right? So we basically create uh, or we write out our number and if it's smaller than 10 we have only one character oct occupied in the terminal in this case we should add one right that is uh, no what am i doing <laughs> then we should add a space like this right and if it is bigger than 10 we already have occupied that space so from now on we have something that uh, that will start or that, that, that will do something. You know, we basically have something that, um, in the end, if there's a zero, if there's a two or an eight here, it will create a space here. If there's an 11, for instance, it will not create a space after that. So now we start at exactly this third column for all, all numbers that we have. And then the next thing that we need to do over here is we need to um, start creating this bar, right? And this bar is, I'll just show you that um, if we add this 25, eight, eight, uh, 89 here, whoops. And then later we'll have to output an end line anyway. Then if we recompile this, whoops. Uh, good morning. There we go. Let's clear that. Let's do that again. Right, and now if we execute this, we see that we have a very good start. The only thing we need to know now is how many times we need to print this block. How do we do that? Exactly. So this is our good exercises again over the for loop, but trust me, this is something that really is necessary. Right, so in this case, we start with another, we need another variable, I'll call this j. J is smaller than, oh, there we already have something. What do we do here? Exactly, my array. You're already thinking ahead, very good. I, exactly. So we basically go from zero to our element. So if our element is 24, we go from zero to 23, right? And we could also start at, at one, of course, but um, in this case, that would be very hard, right? Because in this case, our stopping criteria could be zero. My array i could be zero in this case as well. In this case, we don't need to print out any block. Right? So that's, that's the idea here. And we increment our j. Now when we do this, we basically just print out several times our block, and then we return. So this should be it, right? Correct? So let's clear and see if that did it. 
Perfect. Right, so this is it. So in this case, we have an array. Um, in one for loop, we already initialize the array and we already print out the array numbers and immediately do the bar chart. Now, this is only the start of this exercise, however. What would happen if you would want to have a proper bar chart? These are typically things that you rotate 90 degrees to the right, not to the left, right? So what would happen or what would you need to do if you want to do that? Then you would need the array to be slightly, or then you would need several for, or not one big for loop as you see here, but two. And that would be, I think, a very nice exercise that is actually worth the three peppers that you see over here. So basically the, the home exercise would be try to rotate this to the right 90 degrees. So in that case, I mean, you don't need to print out the numbers, but the bar chart or the bar over here, these seven things would be a stack of seven blocks that go seven high rather than seven to the right. And that would make things a little bit more complicated. But algorithmically, I think it is a very good exercise. Um, that also is a, an exercise for loops as well as arrays. Okay? Right. Moving on. Once you have an array, you cannot just stick to one dimensional arrays, but you can have any dimension you'd like. And then basically you s stick these together. So basically if you want to have a two-dimensional array, which is kind of like a grid or a table, in this case, my table is the name of my array of integers, but it's not a one-dimensional array, it's a two-dimensional array. The first dimension has two, and the second dimension has four. In, uh, uh, and, and the size two over here is reflected on this size over here. So the last one is the actual array of four integers. And of that, I have two. That's how you need to interpret it. In this case, I have here a constant array of four integers. I have here a constant array of four integers. And I collect those as an array again. So I have an array of two arrays of four integers. And this is essentially also how it is uh, stored into memory. So we have an array of four integers, and straight after that, another array of four integers. The C++ compiler, however, needs to know the structure of this two-dimensional array. Right, so essentially, we have actually two arrays, each four long, grouped together in an array which is too long. And this, the array of two is not of two integers, but of two arrays of integers, of size four each. Now, if you initialize those multiple uh, multidimensional arrays, you can do this like this, as we've seen before, if they're short enough. If they're really big, we need to do this with uh, nested for loops. That's why we already started already seeing nested for loop exercises, like this drawing the roof that you had two weeks ago, um, that was due last week. So um, this basically is uh, a nested for loop where over x, we go from 0 to 99, and over y, we go from 0 to 19. And then we have those indices over here of our two-dimensional array. And the nice thing is that map is a two-dimensional array. You can also treat it right as such, right? So that you know this from a table. If you have a table, you have columns and rows. And basically, you can have those rows and columns as the two dimensions. This is something that will come of handy when we continue in our maze game, because also there, uh, when, when creating the drawings of our maze game, we usually work in rows and columns in n curses, as you probably have remembered from the last two exercises uh, in our maze game. And also here, we can use size of. So size of basically gives you just the number of bytes of this particular um, uh, array. In this case, the whole array, my table, will then return the entire size in bytes of this entire array. We know that each integer is four bytes. We know that four times four is 16, so this is 16 over here, and this is 16, so 16 plus 16 is 32. So we have 32 bytes of the whole table. And what you can also do is get uh, the first element, which is an array again of four integers in this case. So four times four is 16 bytes is what size of ta my table zero, or we could have also given here my table one, will return, right? So also that is possible. We can kind of leave out the second index over here, and then this over here is the array, not the element, okay? 
And that becomes a little bit more convoluted, perhaps, or at least it's something that uh, uh, take, gets, uh, you need to get used to. But um, that is also get very powerful. We can create multidimensional structures this way, fill them with values, change those values, and all you need is this one name of this one structure, which gives you access to all of these numbers. Right? So typically we could create this way an image, for instance, or a bitmap, or even an animation, like multiple bitmaps after each other, like a video. We could also have red, green, blue components, as you would have. So this would be three-dimensional. Then you have the grid, which is another dimension. And then you have the frames, which is yet another dimension. Right? So this could be held into one particular three-dimensional, in, in this case, uh, structure in C++. So now we know how to create a movie from a data point of view in C++. And that's where we're going to do a bit more exercise about, and I kind of already um, uh, gave the hints to it. So in our maze game, we have seen that we draw always over the rows and the columns of our screen up until now. Um, and we're going to expand here by drawing now the actual maze. So we've not seen a maze yet, now we're going to. And uh, we already have, uh, or I already gave you uh, a particular maze. You can, you feel fr feel free to welcome, or you're welcome to, or feel free to start any maze here. You could basically initialize any maze in your uh, source code. This gets rather big, right? But uh, here there's a maze of 15 by 10 um, values, zero or one, zero for not being a wall there, and one for being a wall there, for instance. And that we need to draw now on the background, so we have an actual maze uh, for our game. So let's start with that. For that we have to go to a different directory. And I already prepared maze tree. So that's where we go. Also on this side. There we go. And we see that uh, we already have several things. We also have the make file. Remember that this make file we saw last time as something that will make our life a lot easier. So we have here the rules for creating our main program, which depends on these two object files, and then is executing it's executed this way. Also remember that this over here is a tab. If I go left and right, you see that it doesn't. Uh, it's not two spaces, but it's a tab. And remember also here that this tab is, um, is needs a specific setting in nano, because if you do a normal tab, like I would do here, now this is uh, made out of spaces, as you can see. Um, and the way to do this is by setting escape and then O. And you can see then that if you press escape first and then O, you'll see that conversion of type taps to space is disabled, means if I now press the tap, it will be an actual tap. Right? So that's what I um, told you last time. Right, so now we have our, whoops, now we have our make file. There we go. Um, so if we type make, make will actually look at the make file in the current directory and start creating everything there is. And then we'll see that now suddenly there is this there is this O files that are created, but also this maze. And if we then execute maze, we have what we left out, uh, what we had last time. So with our keys, we can navigate in our maze, but the problem is there is no maze yet. There is just a big grassy field, and it's not really that excited to exciting to um, navigate this. So we're going to deal with that. And the way to do this is by expanding on our module draw maze. And we don't need to change anything in terms of functions. We can use exactly the same functions we had last time. So just as a, as a, a, a way to remember you, we have our redraw function. The redraw function basically draws the entire map as well uh, uh, without our player. Then we have our initialization uh, for the end courses library, which basically creates a new screen, initializes new colors. And then we have our draw function, which, which creates them or draws then our player. Right? That's, that's basically it. Now what we're going to do now is um, get another color pair. That would be nice, I think. Um, and this color pair we're going to, uh, what do we do? Let's make it, 
the background will be hmm, blue, perhaps, and the foreground also blue. In this case, we don't really have to draw anything, or we can, we can make it, I don't know, yellow, for instance. Um, and that will be for our walls. If we don't have walls, we basically just use blue on green. Right? That, that's what we need to know. So now we can um, create this particular color pair in N-curses. And the rest is now just drawing this particular maze that is already there. So I, as you see, I included what was on the slides. This is now an array, a two-dimensional array, where the second dimension is 15. That means we have a series of, 50, um, of, uh, of arrays that are each 15 integers long. And this is again packed into an array of, in this case, 10 long. Yeah, 10 long. We could have added here a 10, but since we are initializing this straight away with a constant array, this constant array of two dimensions, we don't need to really do that. Right? So this is all that is necessary. 15 you can't leave out, by the way. You can try that, but then you'll see that the compiler uh, does not really know. It could have known, but in this case, the G++ compiler uh, objects and says we need to know how uh, big this array is over here. Right, now we're going to draw the entire screen, as you can see over here. We go for every line, and then for each line, we go for every column, and then draw here a dot with this particular color pair. Now, this is fine if we don't have a wall. But now we need to add the case that there is a wall, and the case that there is a wall, I think, is something already kind of showing the solution here. We need an if test, right? We need to test whether we have a wall or not based on what we have in our maze. Now, how do we do that? What's our test here? No, the wall is number one over here. This is a wall, this is no wall. This is a wall, this is a wall, this is a wall, and this is no wall. Sorry? Exactly. Maze of um, call or line? First we have the line, and then we have the call, right? And if this is, we'll explicitly say this, if this is one, then we have a wall. And else we have grass, basically. And we can keep on printing grass as we had it before. Right? That is, that is basically what we, are, what we need to do. Or that is all we need to do. So that means here we need to draw something that is a wall. Let's make it an X, for instance. But we also have our color pair that we could use here. Um, to draw it in a particular color. So we immediately have this over here, this over here, and then we, of course, indent um, the proper way. So that means we add one here and here, and over here we use our color pair 3 to kind of create a completely different color for our maze. Right? Is this correct? Will this work? I see some people nodding or some people still thinking. We can just try it out. I just wrote the, the file, right? So we can make. Make will automatically detect what needs to be recompiled. It works. Let's see now what happens if I execute our, uh, our program. Whoa. What happened here? We have here a screen which is way bigger then 15 columns over 10 lines, right? So we start here to access our maze. Um, I mean, over here, for instance, this would be, I assume, 30 by 30 line, the 30th line and the 30th column, for instance. That would be more or less here. Now, this 30th line and the 30th column is not in our maze. So this over here is addressing something in memory which is completely different. Right? That means only this maze over here is the maze we intended. And all the rest is basically just random pieces of memory where some things happen to be a one, a lot of them here, but very few over here. So we kind of now did a buffer overrun. 
we basically draw maze randomly, but uh, it did not really work so well, right? And we can, I mean, we have a nice maze at the top, but not a very nice maze for the rest. Now what we can do, or what can we do here? That's perhaps a very good question. There's a very small uh, thing that we can add here to fix it. Anyone? Uh, yes? It's coming from n curses. That's a very good question. It's coming from n curses, and it's immediately set to the width and the height of your window in characters. So it will be something like uh, the calls would be something like 40 here, and uh, lines would be probably around 30 or 35. Yeah, that's something. That's a number that you automatically get from n curses. Spread out between the exactly. Well, that's one way you could do this. You can basically instead of lines and calls, you could basically hook those to the array. The array is 15 uh, by 10, so if we say the calls in this case is 15 and the lines is 10 and replace those lines and calls for that, we could basically do that. But then we would have a very small maze. Yeah, you can, like, in the index of the, the maze, you mm -hmm. make it into size uh, of the maze. Make it the, the number of, uh, of lines and calls. Exactly. We do, yeah, exactly. You have the, you have, uh, the, the right. So basically here, when indexing our maze, we need to make sure that line and call never go beyond 14 for the number of columns and 9 for the number of lines because 15 and 10 are those dimensions, right? And as you immediately said, that is indeed correct. We basically can actually give here the size of our maze. We could do this by... Um, by auto automatically doing this with a number, or we could do this also with size of, of course. Size of would be the nicer way. How would si size of work here? So what is 15 here? 15 is the size of the second dimension. How do we get the second dimension of our array? Yeah, first, very good. So basically, size of maze, and then we get the first element, for instance, right? So size of maze 0 would be 15, because it would be this first 15 zeros and ones over here. In bytes, of course, so what do we do? We have to, now it's divide by size of maze 0, oops, 0 for instance, the first element of that. Right, so those are integers, those are each four bytes. That means in the end you won't get a 15 here, but you will get a 60 here of bytes. So this is 15 elements, but you will get 60 for size of maze 0. Therefore we divide by maze 0, 0, which is this particular one over here. This is an integer, and the size of that is 4. That means 60 divided by 4 is 15. Okay? Getting a little bit tricky, right? The same you can do for the 10 over here, but I'll leave that. Um, I'm just going to try and see if what we just created works. So also here it compiles. It needed just to um, recompile draw maze.cpp into the object file. Maze.o stays the same, right? That is the nice thing about the make file and using make. Now, if we, cr if we now execute our maze, you will see now that this map that we had is kind of used as a tile, right? So we created only a 15 by 10 maze, but this is tiled in both the x direction or the, the columns direction, as well as the y direction, the lines direction. And now I can move around in the maze and then try to not hit any, oops, okay, I went into a wall here. That's something we'll have to fix still. But this maze is quite tricky already. You can get from the top to the bottom and from the bottom to the top. Now all we need is something to spice up this game. But this is basically already getting a little bit more like a maze game, right? So with the help of multi-dimension arrays, we at least have now the appearance of an actual maze, all right? Good. So that's, that's what I wanted to show you as a, a good example, I think, of where are my slides? There we go. Um, of the, uh, the maze game with a two-dimensional array. So these two-dimensional arrays do actually allow us to do really cool things. 
including bitmaps, including videos and animations. Right? So that's also something that we could start with uh, expand, uh, expanding on to. Right, now the next thing you can do with arrays is you can have an array of characters. And an array of characters is something that is called in programming a string. Like a string is basically a sequence of symbols, like a word or a sentence or a page of text or an entire book of text is basically representable as a string. And essentially a string is nothing more than an array of characters. Right? This is, this is the, the, the core thing you need to remember here. And that's also why we're going to now still see an array of characters as the string. Later, when we know what an object and what a class is, we can then use, finally, C++ as string implementation. But this is not a core concept in C++. This is not a primitive, right? Because basically, when in C++ you're using a string, essentially, you're dealing with an array of characters. That's why I think it's important to already look at, it, uh, at this in this particular way. Okay. So a string is a sequence of symbols, and the symbols are anything. So it could be numbers, it could be uh, characters, it could be uh, text. And in C++, as I said, there is nothing really like a string that you can immediately use. Many others do have this. C++ is very basic, uh, or very uh, um, in its, uh, in, yeah, reduced in its uh, um, number of keywords and in its functionality. But it doesn't mean it doesn't have that. It's just that it's supplied as a standard library, typically. Later on, you will see that. And once we know what object-oriented programming is like, we'll just use a string from a class as an object. But we don't know yet, officially. So now we'll see how these classes are implemented on the lowest level. And this is basically exactly the way we've seen an array being implemented. Except that instead of doubles, or floats, or booleans, um, or integers, we now have characters. And each of those characters basically is part of a sequence. And that's basically an array. The thing, however, that a string adds to this is that for a string, typically, you have something that is a sequence of, er of, of characters. And if you deal with those sequence of characters, dealing with the length of the string is a very important thing. And because of that, all strings are always ended with a zero. Not the character zero, but an actual zero. Also, this is very important to kind of refresh your mind about. So when we have a character, this is nothing but a number, really. An index in a table. And this number is a kind of an index in uh, specifically the ASCII table, where you have the first couple of elements in this table are uh, like a tab, or a space, which is, I think, uh, number 32. And the actual numbers, the actual characters start only in the almost the hundreds. So in the 90s, I think you'll have the, the numbers. And after that come uh, A, B, C, all the way to Z, capitals and small. And then come the symbols like exclamation mark and, and question mark as well. So all of those have a particular number. But uh, when we are programming, we can also, with these single quote marks, access the actual character S, right? So that's, that's what, uh, what, what is also important to keep into mind. So when we then initialize an array of characters, we can use this with those single quote marks. So the first element over here is a number. It's like 130, for instance, and this will be a capital S when you use the quotation marks. This is element zero of a 10 element array of characters. All the way to the end, you will have the tenth element. You index this as a nine, right? So my name nine is in this case, this actual zero. Sometimes you can also, or not sometimes, you can always represent this also as something between the quotation marks with backslash zero. Some of you already know this. Some of you have already used backslash n for getting a new line, for instance, in your string. So these are kind of, this is an escape character and this is a zero. This is nothing else but an actual zero as well. So in the ASCII table, the first element is this special zero character. And this character is used as a special character so that any program that is traversing through the sequence of elements of my name knows where to stop. Because typically, as I said, 
um, you can go beyond the arrays, array boundaries. You just need to know the size. And in especially strings, the size is a little bit burdensome to, uh, or, or cumbersome to deal with. So typically, whenever you have operations on strings, they go over the string and always check where the end of the string is. How do they know that? Well, they say, is this a zero? No. Is this a zero? No. Is this a zero? No. 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 Yes. Over here we have a, a termination character, character zero, and therefore this is the end of the string. We should definitely not go beyond this element over here. Right? And that's, that's completely legal because we know we have uh, an array of 10 lengths, that means we can use the index 1, to uh, 0, 1, 2, all the way until 9. Index 10 is not possible anymore, but instead of having then this 10 as the length of the string, we can basically just check within the string whether we have already seen the 0 termination character. Right? That is the idea. Uh, and there's a reason why um, in strings, typically, your size is one more than the actual, uh, actual string itself. So this uh, name over here is only nine characters long, but we store 10 characters from zero till nine. And the ninth index or the 10th character is the zero to mark the end of the string. And that's how on the lowest level strings are put into your memory and are dealt with with any programming language. Okay. So here's another example, we can immediately start, so this is the way we have already seen, like a shortcut for if you have numbers or booleans or floats, we could do it this way, but this is still very, very long, especially for strings, it's very lengthy. So the way, the easier way to initialize a string is to do it exactly like this. This over here is a string, so it's an array of a certain size with um, constant characters in it. So this is a constant string. And this string is of a particular length. And this is then assigned to my new string, which is basically a character array of no size specified, because just like in the previous example on the previous slide, we know how long this is. Now we could start counting here. Um, I won't do this now, but say that this is about 20 characters long. Then the actual size will be 21. Automatically here at the end, a zero will be appended for a constant string. Right? So keep that in mind. When we have this constant string, we'll have automatically, with this double quotation marks, a string. And this automatically in memory adds the zero at the end of our array of characters, which this constant string basically is. It's just constant. You can't change it anymore. And we already used this up until now. So remember from the first lessons that we had, we've used this output to the terminal with uh, standard uh, console out, with this particular operator, which we still don't know what this is, but now we know that this over here is nothing more than an array of a particular size. In this case, we have 5, 10, 15, 17 characters. So we have 18 uh, a string of characters of 18 long. And this 18th character is this terminator character, the zero over here. So this is what our compiler creates for us in memory. This constant uh, array of characters filled already with the values capital T, small h, small i, and so on, until a zero at the end. And this over here is then sent to our terminal with this particular construct which then kind of looks at this array and then one by one prints out all those symbols to our terminal until it sees the zero at the end of our string. But essentially this is nothing more than a one-dimensional, so an easy, character array. Okay? Even the empty string, when we use this, for instance, as a construct, and you can, still has one element, namely this terminator character. So if you send this to our terminal, in this particular way, for instance, then what our, then what C out and this uh, operator will do is will, it will take this array, it has only this one element, zero, and it says, okay, this is, this is already our zero element, we need to stop. And it does print, doesn't print anything to our terminal. But it is an array of size one, and it has one element, and this contains a zero. And again, this is a constant array, okay? 
So we've already been dealing a lot with constant arrays the whole time already. Now we know that these are constant arrays. These are essentially, the way they are managed in memory, character arrays. Okay, <clears throat> here's a, an, a, an example that is a very good home, a piece of homework, I would say. Here we have two strings, right? Um, and we basically know that we can initialize them as such. So S1 is an array of characters, and we init immediately initialize those as this particular string. S2 is also an array of characters. We know that we can just, uh, like a normal variable, separate them with commas. And also this, we basically initialize as this particular string. Now, what do you have to do, knowing that these are two character arrays, to concatenate those two strings. Concatenate means you create a third string that, or you could also, uh, uh, that, uh, yeah, you could create a third string, so basically another character array, uh, which we then give the name S over here, which should then contain all the, the sequence of S1, and then straight after that, the sequence of characters of S2. So it should then afterwards contain the string apples and oranges. Now, this is quite a lot of work. Try this at home and you'll see that this is not that easy. That is also the reason why most programming languages uh, abstract this very quickly and say, oh, there is this particular primitive called a string, and if you want to do things like concatenation of those two strings, we just basically use that. So this is basically, if you want to do this in this way, so that the concatenated string over here is printed as apples and oranges, it's not that easy. You need loops, you need to check whether the end of that, uh, of that array is already, um, um, is already reached, uh, and so on and so on. It's quite a bit of code that you would need for that. Even though this is a basic concept, right? And this is something that we've already done. We've already concatenated strings because you can actually have one string, and then with this operator over here, you have another string, and you can have multiple strings after each other. Essentially, all of this over here, from here to here, is ending up with a string that is then sent to our output console or our terminal. And this entire string has been concatenated, right? So this has already been happening in the background. But up until now, we haven't seen what this means and what this is, so therefore, we only know the character array. And doing things this way with a character array is sometimes very cumbersome. And this is the example that will show you how. However, it is a very good example on how to deal with arrays in general. Right? So that's why I would still say try this out at home. Right. Then we have um, the special case where arrays can be also passed to functions. We know now that there are functions and we know now that uh, you can pass things to a function like an integer or a double or a boolean and that function will then take the value of that variable and while the function is alive in memory it will have that value, it can be changed once the function is exiting the function will then kind of cease to exist along with all the parameters and all the local variables that were created in that function. This is what we called call by value, very important, right? Now, the important thing about arrays is once you have an array, if you pass an array as a parameter, like we do over here, something special happens. We don't copy this entire array of, in this case, 10 integers long with the name A. We don't copy all those 10 integers to a new piece of memory and then let our swap function, in this case, operate on those, two, those 10 values. And once swap ends, those 10 values are gone. No it actually passes the entire array itself. And that's a very important distinction. Because this is called call by reference. And call by reference actually makes this swap function work. Remember when we saw functions, this swap function would not work if you just had two, two integers over here. Because what happens, remember what we looked at in memory, is those two integers would ta be taken the values of if you would call this swap function. And then those two values would be then created in memory and later deleted, and that's it. So after this um, function ends, that's it. You know, you didn't really swap the actual variables that were given to this function in the function call. 
In this case, however, when we give this array over here, we give the actual array. That means over here, when we are in memory in the swap uh, function, this array over here is the actual array that we gave to our swap function, whatever name it is. So you could give um, a, a, a function like my array. You give the my array function over here, and we need to make sure that it's an, uh, also of size 10. Um, but in that case, those indices over here are just copied. Those are just numbers. But the actual array itself will be the actual memory location. And that is something very special. Why that is, we will see much later when we look at pointers and references. But from now, if you pass an array to a function, you don't copy all its values and give that to the function. No, you give the actual array to that function. And if you then change something in that array during that function's lifetime, and then the function ends, those changes will still be there because you gave the actual array, not the values. So in this case, when we say that the temp local variable gets the value of ai, so this is the i th element uh, in, in a, right? And then uh, ai becomes the new value of aj, and then aj gets then that value of temp. So this way we swapped those two locations, or the, the values on those two locations, i and j. In that case, after this uh, swap function ends, this array that was given here has indeed swapped its two elements. Okay? Very, very important. Um, that makes also functions a lot more powerful, of course. Functions like this can now actually do swapping. Up until now, functions were very toothless, right? We didn't really, they, they were taking all the values, but they were never really changing parameters that we would give in a function call. In this case, when we do swap of my array comma two comma three, then the uh, then elements in index two and three, so the third and the fourth element will be swapped when we call that function. Try this at home, but also remember that if you pass an array through a function as a parameter, then you pass the actual array. You don't copy the array or you don't have a new array with exactly the same values as the array, you give that actual array, uh, that array to the, to the function. And if you add or if you declare a function, you don't even need to know what size it is. And of course, here you hopefully can already expect that this leads to lots and lots of difficulties. Because you need to then be a responsible programmer to then immediately ask for the size of this array over here. Because when we call this function swap later then, after it's been declared and afterwards defined like this and implemented, then we know that uh, if you call the swap function with a particular array, that we need to know for sure that this is not going over a particular border. Uh, because we give these indices i and j, if j would be 500, but we would only look at an array of, uh, of 10, for instance, we would be in trouble. We would have an array overrun similar to how we just did it with the maze function and how we explained it on the slides earlier. That would be bad. You would be accessing memory that is not yours, okay? And then finally, a note, when you are dealing with arrays, you have to know that if you deal with arrays, you can, of course, ask for a character array from the inputs. Now, again, this is a construct that we don't really know about, but you know, we want to deal already with uh, examples and assignments where the user is asked, for instance, for a string. And if we ask a string the, the straightforward way, the way we know it, we would do this like this. So a string we know is a character array. And we basically initialize a character here, a character array here, which is a buffer of 80 characters. And then we give this, or we basically fill this with C in. Actually, it should be STD C in. Let me just immediately stop this. There we go. And there we go. That's the proper way. There. Then it fits nicely and is again um, nicely structured. So basically, this is how you would assume if you ask, for instance, the user to give you a, a sentence or a name, a full name. What is your full name? 
you then basically ask him before and now you put this in this character array buffer. Now the problem is if you do that and you can try this out, it will have a couple of flaws, a couple of things that might not be very clear why they're happening, but they're happening nonetheless. The first thing is if you then add your name over here, my name is or Christoph van Laarhoven, and the problem is it will start or uh, stop already after Christoph because if you have an empty space, then uh, then C in will already stop reading. That means an empty space is kind of already the end of what it considers as an input. That is not so nice if you do it with this particular operator over here. The other problem is we have here a buffer of 80 characters. If my name would be exceptionally long or if I would uh, start typing in a whole essay here, I would have an overrun. I would basically then store only the 80 first characters without the zero character. And that's, that is also a problem. And it's not really a string or can be used as an actual string. So th that's, those two things are things that are not really nice and therefore won't allow us to kind of ask the user with C in, as we've seen it up until now, to ask for a string. And the reason why is, well, we'll see that later. The reason why is because of this operator over here. But what we can do, however, is we can have a particular other construct, which is this one over here, where we ask uh, C in, so the input console, so basically what the user is typing, to limit this at 80 characters. Um, and in this case, we do actually get the behavior that we wanted. If there is an enter, we basically stop. Um, and then uh, it will not fill the entire buffer, of course, if we didn't reach it yet. But there will be a zero at one point somewhere in the middle. And this will allow this particular string to be treated as a string. It is maximally 80 characters long. The last character, uh, however, is always a zero. That means the user can here give a string of 79 characters long with this particular approach. Now, this is where I wanted to end today. Um, and because you might ask yourself, so what is this particular construct still, right? And I think some of you, or at least 20% uh, of you already know what this is. Any guesses what a get, what get is? Get is a? A method, very good. So some people already know. Uh, what I'm talking about, but it has the function, it has basically the, the, the look and feel of a function, right? So this is basically like a function call. You basically have get, which is the name of the function, and then here you have the parameters. You basically uh, add buffer, which is an array, and we know now that if you pass an array to a function, that you actually pass this actual array, don't copy it, and we give the value 80, which is the size of that array. So this is kind of like a function, but we'll call this in the future a method because of this dot over here and what happens beforehand. What is C in? Object class. Excellent. No, it's not a class, it's an object. And th this is still very, very important, a very important concept to learn. And I think many people that see uh, C++ course still mix classes with objects quite a lot, although they are significantly different. Um, so thank you for saying class, whoever was saying class. Um, it is an object of a particular class. STD is a namespace that we'll see later as well. Um, but that means this over here is something that we will see from next week onwards, and that will create the basis of object-oriented programming. It means from now on we will always juggle around with basic variables like integer or float or boolean, um, we will use functions, however we call them from now on methods because those functions will stick to a particular object which is an instance of a particular class. That's kind of a preview of what will happen from next week onwards and then we'll start with actual C++ programming with objects and with ways to deal with objects and create objects everywhere we go. All right, but that's it for this week. Thank you for attending and for your attention. We'll see each other tomorrow.